Well, after a bye week and a little round of golfs, back to work, by the way, your wedge game, not bad. <laughs> not bad, but not very good. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Can the Nittany Lions snap Ohio State's 20-game unbeaten road streak? I don't know. We'll find out, Todd. They have to lose sometime, right, yeah. on the road? Why not this week, right? Absolutely. And thanks to the Badgers for pushing the Buckeyes to the very limit. Maybe the Nittany Lions can finish them off this time. Yep. We'll talk about it coming up on the Blue-White Tailgate. Great to have you with us on the show as Penn State gets ready for Ohio State. And coming up on the show, we'll take a look at both teams. Joey Galloway is going to join us to talk about the game. The good, the bad, the ugly picks. All sorts of fun stuff. And maybe we'll talk about Trey's golf game. Uh, no. Please. So Please no. that's out. We'll add that to the list of things <laughs> Trey doesn't like. <laughs> but, you know, they taught bye week. I mean, really, I mean, timing I thought was pretty good for him. No doubt about it. Right in the middle of the season, time to get healthy and ready. And, you know, Ohio State is coming, and y you can use two weeks to get ready for them. And Urban Meyer was very complimentary about Wisconsin's coaching staff, some of the new wrinkles they threw into the game plan. So expect the Nittany Lions to do the same thing. The last thing you want to be when you face Urban Meyer in Ohio State is predictable. Exactly. All right. So let's check out the update desk and Mandy Nyad. Thanks so much, Steve. Hope you all had a chance to catch some baseball with your time off this weekend. Let's dive right into your Health South Injury Update Board. Coach mentioned Cabinda, Bell, and Cooper haven't practiced at all, but are expected back this week. They didn't take the week off physically, just mentally, and we can expect to see Gilligan back. That is your Health South Injury Update Board. Now let's take a look at all the action around the Big Ten. Purdue says au revoir to their head coach, Daryl Hazel, after a 9-33 record. They'll face Nebraska. In case you didn't know, au revoir means you're fired in French. Wisconsin at Iowa will be at noon. And obviously, Michigan State at Maryland will be one to watch as well. Since it's week six in the NFL, I thought we'd take a look at some of the Lions in the league. Adrian Amos for the Chicago Bears had three tackles against the Jaguar in, no surprise, a Bears loss. Paws for the Jags had 11 tackles, along with Jared Odrick's three tackles. We also saw some Lion versus Lion action in the Dolphins-Steelers game. Mike Hole had two solo tackles for Miami. Jesse James had two catches for 13 yards. No touchdown this time, even though he's had one in three of his last five games. Tom Bahali, a fumble recovery in this week's Kansas City win over the Raiders. And Jack Crawford for the Cowboys had two tackles in their 30-16 win over the Packers. There's some of your highlights for the Lions around the league. And now Mandy's star of the week goes to this referee for smacking Urban Meyer in the face and then awarding him with a 15-yard penalty. What could be better? Maybe we'll have some luck like that this weekend at Beaver Stadium. Thanks so much. Back to you guys. It's interesting. Uh when we did the bye week show and we were done and I walked out, our executive producer, John Stroh, said, hey, Steve, have a good one. Au revoir. I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. is that like it's some sort of internal code here? I I said, no. right. okay. Needless to say, trying to up my game here a little bit. Grant Haley says, look, the program, this would be a big week and a big win for them. Yeah, we want to win this for our coaching staff. We want to win this for our fans, and we want it for our, just ourselves as well. I mean, it's a great opportunity. I mean, not a lot of people get to, you know, play big time games like this. So, you know, just we're confident right now. We're feeling we're feeling good about ourselves. We're rested up. Um, we studied a lot of films. Um, you know, we have a good game plan going into this week. So, you know, just going against like the number two team in the country um, and just coming off of you know two victories at home it's just it's just a great feeling right now um, in this program of just the success and the opportunity that we may have for Ohio State every week's like a playoff week because they're trying to get to the college football playoffs. so this is another playoff game what about for Penn State what do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's a huge opportunity for Penn State. I mean, right now with the two different programs, you know, Ohio State's in a different spot than where we are right now. 
Um, you know, they just they just reload every single year. I mean, going over the statistics of Ohio State and to see Urban Meyer lose four games in four years, and you know, it's just it's just crazy, right? So I think it's going to be really a really unique opportunity for the kids, and I just hope that they play well. Everybody talks signature win, signature win. Well, can we get somebody in the teens in the rankings? Maybe about fifteen or twenty. <laughs> number two, number three, Michigan. I mean, there seems to be this discrepancy. It's either they're in the top five. Or anyway, you know, Big Ten's got four teams in the top ten, so yeah. maybe Wisconsin or from Nebraska came to town. But Ohio State, look, it's a tough task, no doubt about it. All right, let's take a look at the series between the two teams. Ohio State's the only team that Penn State has played every year since they joined the Big Ten. So this is the 24th straight year they've played. You can see how it's played out in the series. And for Urban Meyer, I'm going to Penn State. It's another whiteout. I have another tough task. A team that's 4-0 at home and... and uh... Uh, I called it and, uh, the last two times. Wish they'd save the whiteouts for other games, but I guess that's using for our game. But it's uh, it's uh, one of the top five atmospheres again in college football. So, got to get them healthy. Got to get them rested because another team with a bye week night game, and get them ready to go. And what did I say last week? <laughs> saw it coming. All right. And that's exactly, if I were him, that's exactly what I would say. Another week, another bye week for somebody else. I mean, because that does build it in. But the whiteout brings with it an atmosphere where the lights go on and the juice goes up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's, there's nothing. There's nothing better than a than a whiteout Beaver Stadium. Mean, if you've ever had the opportunity or have an opportunity to go, you guys should definitely try to do that because it's something that you'll never experience. Not at a pro game, not at any other college place. You know, whiteout at Penn State is where it's at. Yeah, it's terrific. All right. So coming up, we will take a look at the Penn State offense, Nittany Line defense, and a look at Ohio State as we continue with the Blue White Tailgate after this. We'll go back, uh, look at the offense, and uh, what kind of progress do you guys think the offense has made in the opening half of the season? Well, I mean, I mean, for me, it's like the fact is they're protecting um, McSorley much better. Um, they're actually running the ball now the last few weeks with uh, Barkley. And, uh, you know, I think they've come a long way, and they were, what, like last week they were our offensive player of the game, right? Yeah. Incremental progress, yep. right, in just yeah. about every single area. You get Trace McSorley used to starting. You get him a, a start at Michigan. Things don't go so well, but maybe he's going to be ready next time he faces a top five program, which is uh, this weekend against <laughs> Ohio State. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our Stocker Chevrolet Drive of the Week, which happens to be the drive of the first half of the season, brought to you by Stocker Chevrolet, located on the Benner Pike across from the Nittany Mall. We selected the opening drive of the Maryland game, guys, going through. They start at their own 16-yard line. They go 84 yards on this drive. It was just a really good mix in this drive of run and pass in this RPO. Yeah, and the thing is, it just, to me, it looked like, you know, they really are getting more comfortable with the scheme that they have. You know, they're, they're, they've got the right player playing the quarterback position. You know, I think Hack last year was a little bit uncomfortable being in that position. Um, and uh, Trace, I think, is doing a great job. It's a great example of the potential of this offense. Accuracy with McSorley, the legs, what he can do. Get Barkley a little bit of space. Gasicki, the wideouts, catching the ball. You know, when it's right there in their chest or in their hands. So, so it's a real good example of the potential. And to strike early was very important in that game as well. Yeah, it took care of business on that drive. And it allowed them to play with the lead the rest of the game, which was really important. So now let's get to our family clothesline, player to watch on offense. And that would be quarterback Trace McSorley. Again, here's a guy maturing in the offense, and this is somebody that when we look at McSorley as to how he handles things, he's used his legs more the last couple of weeks. It's made a big difference. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, you know, he is he is definite, uh, you know, dual threat guy right now. You know, we couldn't say the same thing about Hack last year. Just he's a different player. But the fact is McSorley c clearly has command of the offense. Um, he's got the locker room. He's got the... Um, uh, the huddle, and uh, you know it's going to be interesting to see how he does. I mean, you know, they're playing the best team they're playing all year on Saturday. And how imperative is it, guys, to see third down, you moving and running up the field as the chains are moving, as opposed to all 11 guys running towards the sidelines because you didn't get the first down, and here comes the punter. Yeah. And James Franklin knows the quarterback and the RPO in the run game really important. Um, I do think uh, Trace's ability to run changes things. I think it really does. I think it helps your offensive line. It also, it also affects the defensive coordinator in things that they're going to call. 
and how they're going to call them and why they're going to call them and when they're going to call them. Um, because when you know if you have a drop back quarterback who is not a threat to scramble compared to one that is, it, it affects how you do things. The rock of Gibraltar, though, in this offensive line for the last three years has been Andrew Nelson. He's been the best player they've had. Now out for the year, you could see the emotion on the players' faces when he went out. The guy that stepped into that game was Paris Palmer, and they took – in that game, Brendan Mann, they flipped him over to right tackle. So what does this do for the dynamics of the offensive line? Well, I mean, I just hope, you know, hopefully for Paris's uh, standpoint and for all of our, you know, watching the game or whatever is that he plays better than he did last year. You know, I mean, he's still a young guy. He's got a long way to go. Um, but, you know, they're going to be playing against guys that are very, very athletic. They're, they're, they're fast off the edge. I think it's going to be really difficult for him. What seeing is believing. The coaching staff believes in Paris Palmer that he can get the job done, and we'll see if he can. And, you know, not much has went right. At, at Ohio State, the last couple times they've went there, outscored 101 to 24. But Saquon Barkley rushed for 194 yards last time at the Horseshoe. So for Paris and the rest of the offensive line, just get this guy a little bit of space to do what he can do. The two tailbacks, really three, if you want to throw Curtis Samuel in there, you know, Barkley and Weber, not just really good in the RPO, but if you watch them in the RPO when the quarterback carries the ball. That running back's the lead blocker, and Weber and Barkley, I think, are both really good lead blockers when they don't have the ball. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I can't see so much about Weber because I don't know him that well, but, you know, Saquon he Barkley to me. Of you. Well, yeah, you <laughs> should, for God's sakes. But anyway, um, you know, Saquon Barkley is one of the hardest working guys on the team. You know, it's no surprise that, you know, that, that they're opening up the running game, and he's, you know, putting his nose in there. Um, he's helping Trace out with the running game. It's interesting, you know, Ohio State played a power football team last week. And in a lot of ways, Indiana does some of that same stuff. They haven't, you know, they've seen some run pass option this year, but not to this extent. And Ohio State was vulnerable to the run last week yeah. against the Badgers. They gave up their first rushing touchdown of the season in the fourth quarter. So Wisconsin, they had that game in hand a little bit, let it slip away in overtime, but they showed a little bit of vulnerability in Ohio State. Now throwing the football. Sometimes you have to throw the football to open up the running game, and Deshaun Hamilton feels that they've done a great job over the last few weeks of finding that rhythm in the pass game. Said it keeps the defense on their toes and it leaves them guessing on what we might do on this play, what we might do on the next play. And, you know, we're basically just reacting off of them so we can put ourselves in the best situation. So, you know, we try to think of it as the defense can't be right at the same time. And then, you know, it just happens. We're just relying on our weapons. There's another guy that can really create some issues here, and that's Mike Gesicki, the tight end. He can be a matchup problem and create some plays in this offense. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's clearly a very athletic guy. I think he's getting more confidence. I think Trace has more confidence in him as far as catching the football. Again, you can't play, you know, tight end in this offense and not, be, not catch the ball. Okay, you're going to be on the bench, right? But he's feeling more and more comfortable, and I think that, uh, you know, that spreads to everybody on the offense. A good possession guy. Get him started early on first and second down and get six, seven yards right out of the box instead of, those tackle for losses, you got to avoid those on first down to put yourself behind. And I'm going to go to the point you make all the time, Todd. You always talk about third down. You talk about third yeah. down all the time. Now, they're nine for their last 19 in third down, all right, from the fourth quarter of the Minnesota game. So the last five quarters, they're nine for 19 on third down. They're going to need that in this game. Well, let's make second down the new third down, right? <laughs> can, can, we, can we do that? Just go first, second down, and then first down again. Let's avoid it all together. But Look, against Michigan, and you know, I just mentioned that, they'd get those tackles for losses. And we mentioned Paris Palmer in the offensive line, the read option. Sometimes the run plays develop slowly, and then Saquon would get hit in the backfield. All of a sudden, it's second and 13. They've got to avoid those situations because then it makes it difficult. When you do get to third down, you're in third and nines and third and eights. You can get those. You're going to be in third down. You know that's going to happen, but you want to be third and four or less manageable. if you can. Yes. Yeah, manageable. Yeah, manageable. Stay on schedule. That's what you need to do. And the other part is you got to take care of the football. I mean, you have to have chunk plays, big plays, 20 yards or better, and you have to have, win the turnover margin. You do that, you put yourself in a great spot to win. Yeah, and they have done that. They've done it the last few weeks, and, you know, they're not turning the ball over as much. I mean, that's going to be, you know, one of my keys to the game. We're going to talk about it, you know, later, is that you know, Ohio State does a really good job protecting the football. And, you know, if you're, if you're playing for Urban Meyer and you're putting the ball on the ground, you're going to be sitting on the bench. Well, I mean, J.T. Barrett only has four interceptions all season. Yeah. I mean, that's all he's thrown the entire year. Yep. I mean, so he may not be accurate at times, but he, when he misses, he misses everybody. Yeah. Right? That, that, that's big. 
uh, and that's one of your keys to the game? Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, I, I mean, think. Well, no, Todd and I have to make notes as oh. to what we don't <laughs> talk about when we get to that segment. <laughs> All right. So, okay, so Todd, okay, turn, scratch that yeah. out. <laughs> That's out. All, All right. right, coming Duly up. Duly noted. <laughs> Duly noted, indeed. Coming up, we'll take a look at the Nittany Line defense. Tough task for them coming up against this Ohio State offense as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. Well, in the previous segment, we talked about the Penn State offense in the opening half of the season. Now let's get to the Penn State defense in the opening half of the season. A little different discussion, I think, now in the month of October compared to the discussion we may have had in the month of September. Fair enough? Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, you know, and we're past that point of, like, the injuries. You know, Coach has been saying maybe we'll get Kabinda back, maybe we'll get Bell back. I mean, we need to have some, some guys that have experience playing against Ohio State. It's the best team we're going to play all year, and we need to get those guys healthy in the game. Oh, it's a huge challenge at the same time. At least it's a defense that's used to seeing RPO every day, right? Absolutely. I mean, they see it in practice. They should be know. They should know what their assignment football is. And you know, we just hope and hope and hope we can see a guy named Cabinda, a guy named Bell back on the field, maybe Cooper. I mean, just to get in that mix, get some fresh bodies in the game. And yes, they're not going to be the same as what they were at the very beginning of the season as far as conditioning, playing, but at least get them some reps in there and get some fresh bodies. Yep. Obviously, at Ohio State, the, the talent has been obviously here the entire time. And then over time, with three recruiting classes, Penn State's closed the gap. I mean, can you see that now happening, that they've closed the gap? Not that Ohio State's come down. They have not. They've stayed up well, high. Well, it's an example of, like, Michigan. The talent gap you saw there a little bit, too. And, sure. and then to hit the road makes it and just magnifies it a little bit. You know, there's definitely a talent gap between these two teams that is closing and then you get them in your place, and hopefully that helps to close it within a 60-minute game as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the fact is that they still are clearly, you know, pro in my opinion, the best team in the Big Ten until someone really knocks them off and until right. they can kind of, you know, get them on the schneid, they're, they're still the best team in the conference. When you have a young team, how important is it for them to start establishing a, a foothold at home and being a really good home team? I think it's really important. I mean, if you have a, I mean, I mean, it's 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 really important for you know any kind of team, but certainly for a young team at home. You know, a lot of people in the community here have been talking about this game for a long time. You know, we've won a couple games in a row. We're starting to look better, um, and you know that's all everyone's talking about in State College. If anybody's wondering, that's what they're talking about. Oh, uh, James Franklin on Ohio State and Penn State matching up talent-wise. You know, there's a chance we could get Cabinda back this week. Now, now we all have to just kind of remember too. He hasn't played football or practiced in a long time. You know, so to think you're just going to jump back in there um, after missing that amount of time, <coughs> um, you know, is is going to be a challenge. You know, same thing with Brandon Bell. So we'll, we'll see. And the same thing with Cooper. Um, there's a chance we could get those guys back, but we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Ohio State is young uh, in many many areas. But they're not young at that center guard combination with Pat Eflin, who's really good, and Billy Price, who's really good. That's really part of the key to what they do. Where they get a lot of yards is through that middle gap area with these two guys. Yeah. We saw a lot of, yeah. uh, in the past few years, sorry to interrupt sure you, Trey, no, but we no, saw right. a lot of... You know, a lot of runs through the middle gashing the defense. I mean, those nightmares are still fresh a little bit watching Braxton Miller, Ezekiel Elliott, and those guys. And if they open up those holes for Samuels and Weber, you know, you see more of the same from, from the Buckeyes. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's the postseason in baseball, and it's like how you are up the middle defensively yeah. is going to determine, you know, kind of the, the strength of your team. You know, the fact is Ohio State is very young, but up the middle, um, you know, they've got a lot of veteran experience, and it's really showing. Corner Grand Haley knows everybody has to commit when it comes to the Ohio State run. I mean, I, I love supporting the run. Um, anything, anytime you know you, the corner can come down and hit, just shows a different aspect of the game. Um, but we're obviously pass players first. I mean, they're a run, run pass option team, so we got to stay disciplined. Um, but anytime we have the chance to come down and hit, um, make a tackle, um, like in the box, that's, that's, that's going to be helpful to our defense. And no question. He does make a key point early in that answer, Trey. He says, look, he says, we're also pass guys first. He's a corner. He's got to take care of that responsibility, yeah. then help in the run. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, with football, 
obviously, you know, as you move up the food chain, you know, who's going to determine or who's going to, you know, impose their will on the offense and defensive line. You know, if we can get some sort of pass rush and we can get, you know, uh, harassing uh, JT Barrett a little bit, it's going to be, you know, a, a good day for the Lions. And on that point, harassing JT Barrett, I have a question for you as, as far as how much new stuff do you implement in a game like this? When you're the underdog, where you got a talented team that you're facing like that, how much pre-snap movement are you doing? How much are you trying to fool JT Barrett into checking from a pass to a run or to a run to a pass? Well, I mean, normally if you had guys that were, you know, a veteran group, you could throw a lot of different looks in there. You know, it's like, okay, so they're honoring the 30 years of the national championship team in 86. So for that game, you know, we had six weeks to prepare. We had 150 different defenses. They're not going to throw 150 different defenses right. in it, uh, you know, against for Ohio State. Family clothesline, defensive player to watch, safety Marcus Allen. He made his debut in this game against Ohio State in Beaver Stadium two years ago. Played really, really well. Last year banged up. You know what, guys? He's really come back. I think he's played pretty well for them. And he's, gonna be, he's critical in this. Yeah, great tackler. I mean, look, they've asked the secondary to make a lot of tackles. And Marcus at 22 a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, the guy's certainly doing a good job. And yeah, that was one of the subjects we talked about for the first four or five weeks is the tackling, which seems to be short up a little bit. But mm -hmm. boy, will that be really, really important to wrap up as soon as you get one of these guys. Yep. Well, of course, the return kicking game will be critical on both sides. Cameron Johnson, we'll talk about him a little bit later. But coming up on the show, Joey Galloway is going to join us. The good, the bad, the ugly, where we excel. Jay, what do you have in the uh, film room? Thanks, Steve. Coming up in the film room, we're going to talk about Ohio State's offense, which will remind people of Penn State's 05 offense. And we'll talk about Ohio's defense and how great they are in situations. Coming up in the film room. Welcome to the Film Room, brought to you by Letterman, Sports Girl, and Gastropub. And just so you know, Gastropub means food that is fancier and better than that of a pub. Now, with the heat wave through Center County this week, tell me a little bit about some hot streaks. Well, Ohio State's coming in, maybe the hottest team in the country. And take a look at this first graphic. 20-0 in road games under Urban Meyer, 17-0 in October under Urban Meyer, 13 straight wins in night games. So hopefully all three of those streaks can end for Ohio State here in Happy Valley. Okay, and last week we talked about some big athletes. Tell me about the big three for this week. Well, big three for Ohio State are their quarterback, Barrett, Samuel, who's a wide out running back, and Weber. And if you look at the numbers they put up and where they rank in the Big Ten, a lot of success there. 250 yards rushing for those three guys per game is an unbelievable number. Let's take a look at how they do that. Starting with Samuel. Samuel is a guy that's very, very unselfish. He lines up at wide. You've got to find out where he's lined up. And here you're going to see him block on the edge very aggressively. Take a look at the video. You'll see him come off the edge there. He's taking on a guy who's bigger than he is, fights his rear end off, and, and the, the running backs will be able to get around the edge. Now, you take a look at him now. He lines up at wide out. He's going to motion back into running back. Now Weber's going to block. So these guys are unselfish. They work for each other. Take a look at the video here. And you'll see Weber all the way from the tailback spot getting not only to the second level because that's blocked, going all the way to the third level to find a safety, and Samuel getting around the edge to make a play. So those are going to be key things for Ohio State is how well they can get those guys involved. Now, the third part of that big three co combination is J.T. Barrett. Obviously, he's a number, he leads the, the Big Ten in passing efficiency, but he's also a very effective runner. Here's a play they run inside the, in the red zone. They love this play. They motion the tight end, and there are no backs. They motion the tight end, and all of a sudden, Barrett becomes really your tailback, and the, the tight end becomes a fullback. So it's really almost like being in the eye with a bunch of wideouts out there and having an extra blocker. Now, take a look at how this happens. They motion the tight end in. He gets set. He kicks out the backside edge, and Barrett gets north and south. Penn State fans will remember that play. Braxton Miller scored on it. Uh, Barrett scored on it against Penn State in the past. So it's hopefully it doesn't bring up too many bad memories. Now, as far as the pass game goes, Ohio State has had some issues in the pass game these last couple of weeks, and there's some questions about whether they can throw the ball effectively enough. One of the things that's happened to them is teams are starting to play a lot more zone against them. They're starting to sit on the routes, and you'll see here what happens is Wisconsin comes up, they bring four, take a look at the video, and you'll see the guys in the secondary don't drop back real far. They sit, they sit, and that puts pressure on Barrett, and they come and get him on that one. Wisconsin did a great job of that on Saturday for most of the game. Now, 
One of the things about Barrett is when you do play zone and you do sit back, you better contain him and you better make sure he doesn't get outside the pocket. Here you're going to see some stunts with the defensive line up front. Barrett's going to extend the play. Take a look at this on video now from right behind. You see he's looking downfield. He doesn't look like he's got guys open. He gets pressure, and you'll see how strong he is in the lower body. He's getting pulled to the ground, gets out of it, gets downfield, keeps his eyes downfield, and makes a big play. Penn State is going to have to limit that. Now, let's talk about Ohio State's defense, one of the best defensive units in the country. Let's take a look at the first graphic that we got here. You can see where they rank in the Big Ten. They're great in situations. They are incredibly confident as a defense in the third downs, red zones, and getting turnovers. Now, how do they do it? Let's take a look at the the first uh, screenshot we got here. Now, here's a third down and three. Wisconsin is a power run team. They expect pass. They're going to drop eight guys. And you'll see how effectively they get there with three guys rushing the passer here. So, again, there's eight guys. Nowhere to go with the ball. They do a great job coming around the ed- edge, making the play, getting the sack. Now, here's another third down, third down and seven. So they go from rushing three now to rushing five. They go from zone to man-to-man. So you're going to see a lot of different things. It's going to be up to Trace McSorley to realize what's happening and try and make some things happen. So let's take a look at this video here. Now, here comes the pass rush. Here comes the blitz of the linebacker. They get pressure. There is nowhere to go with that ball quickly because of the fact that they're covering so well. Now, some of the things Ohio State has had problems with are motion and shifts. And when you look at the motions and shifts, Wisconsin shifts their tight ends. They motion this guy, run the jet sweep, take a look at what happens. They're trying to chase it with the backside corner. And when he gets the ball, it's hard for that corner to get all the way around and make that play. So they gain 10, 12 yards. Now, one of the things Ohio State's defensive staff is very good at. Greg Schiano has got a lot of experience as a defensive coordinator. Luke Fickle's got a lot of experience as a defensive coordinator. Great football coaches. And they, so last week against Wisconsin, having trouble with the jet sweep. So what they do now is instead of the corner chasing, now they're going to bring the safety down. they got great tacklers in the secondary. So take a look at how they handle this with the video. Okay, the corner, they're talking. You can see the communication. Here comes the safety down here. It makes a great hit, a very physical hit. And needless to say, that was in the second half. That was the last time you saw the Jets sweep out of Wisconsin. I believe in these guys and the power of a whiteout. I say this game is close and competitive. I think you're right, but we'll see. And again, Penn State's going to have to get some turnovers, make some things happen for themselves in the first half, get the crowd into it, get them going. And, you know, the Ohio State offense that you're going to see is going to remind a lot of people of the Penn State offense in 05 when they had the big whiteout win against Ohio State. Hopefully, Penn State turns the tables on. I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, some warm weather as well. No rain. That'd be great. Thanks so much for joining us in the film room, brought to you by Letterman, Sports Grill, and Gastropub. They may be young, but they are darn good. You know, if you're going to be young... It, you know, it's not going to be completely young across the board. If I'm going to have a young football team, I want to be veteran in some key spots. I want to be veteran at quarterback. I want to be veteran with a center, maybe with a guard combo. Veteran at middle linebacker. These are all your communication spots. Veteran at safety, which they aren't, and have a lockdown corner. They've got four out of the five things I'm talking about where you, I think if you have veterans that work your way out, it makes it easier Fair enough? Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, the other thing is they are young, but the fact is they've learned from some of the best guys in college football. You know, they had 13 draft picks or 14 draft picks last year, five first-rounders. I mean, they're learning from really, really good football players, and they just feel like it's their time to shine. It's the definition of reloading and not rebuilding, (laughs) right, the Ohio State Buckeyes. And here's the thing. You know, we talked about Urban Meyer's road record. He's undefeated. No, he hasn't lost a Big Ten game on the road. You know, he doesn't play those games. That means the players have yeah. not lost a Big right. Ten road game. And when you go on the road knowing you have that history of success, you're just thinking to yourself, at some point, we're going to take over this game. Yep. Here's the Urban Meyer file. Um, I haven't seen numbers like that since you coached Pee Wee football, Trey, really. Yeah, that's right. I, very, very impressive. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful coach, you know, he, he started his career at Utah, obviously went to Florida, won two national championships, probably should have two at Ohio State, but Scott won, yeah. um, and he's, he, he's legit, he, he's a great coach. Yeah, no doubt. Now let's look at the Ohio State Big Ten offensive numbers. Okay, um, 
Sorry, we didn't mean to scare the populace. <laughs> 500, 500 yards a game, yeah. 300 on the ground. Yeah. So they're averaging more on the ground than they are through the air. Uh, it's just impressive. Just impressive all yeah. over. I want to talk about JT Barrett for a moment. Last year, they were in a tough spot. You know, Cardale Jones, JT Barrett. He got hurt before the national championship run. Jones has the great championship run. Jones gets picked essentially in the preseason to be the quarterback. This guy stayed engaged, always had the headset on. Everybody said he was always the leader. And when the moment came, which, by the way, was in the Penn State game last year, if Cardale Jones is quarterbacking that game all the way through, we may have a different discussion. Uh, he came in, changed the entire dynamics. This guy is a leader in the truest sense of the word. He doesn't get too concerned about outside entities. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's clearly the guy who's leading that football team. You know, he's got a lot of big time, big game experience. Um, it clearly shows you can't rattle a guy. Oh. Um, he's got command of the offense, um, and I think the coaches, you know, really feel comfortable with him, you know, being the leader of their team. Inevitable that he would get the job back at some point, sure. and I think that's probably how he felt about it. And you mentioned you can't get rattled. Uh, Camp Randall's a pretty tough place to yep. play. After yep. halftime, 199 yards total for JT Barrett. Great throw to Noah Brown to win the game yep. in overtime, back shoulder throw. I mean, everything you would want from, the, from your quarterback, he delivers it. Yep. James Franklin's very impressed with what Barrett brings to the table. But he's, you know, he's got good size. He's got good quickness. He's strong. He's very, very strong uh, and plays that way. You see him breaking arm tackles and wiggling out of things. Um, he's got good change of direction. Um, and like I said, he's, he's been doing it for a number of years. I think the biggest thing is you know, he, they go into it each week purposely, you know, purposeful in terms of he is going to be a part of their running game. Mandy Nyad comes back and we'll talk with Joey Galloway as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. This offense, and they get the ball to him in a variety of ways. Leading receiver, 29 yeah. catches for him, and, and the guy can just absolutely fly. So he's one of those guys, we talk about getting Saquon Barkley the ball as much as possible, 31 carries in the last game. This is the kind of guy you want handling the rock if you're an Ohio State fan. All right, so we looked at the Ohio State offensive numbers. Let's look at the defensive numbers. Again, as a public service, we try not to do this to scare the populace. But again, their defensive numbers have been fabulous all the way through. They've got takeaways. They end up, look, starting with Raquan McMillan in the middle and Tyquan Lewis and Conley at corner. Hooker has four interceptions. Latimer had been the nickel guy last year. He's got three picks at the other corner. I mean, they go after it. They get touchdowns with their defense. Yeah, I mean, they're... You know, to me, the most important thing, I think, is looking at the points per game that they're giving up. You know, they're giving up, what, 12.7, I think, is what yeah. the stats showed. And, you know, you're holding, you're holding you know, Division One, you know, big-time college football teams to so less than two touchdowns in a game. You, you're doing something. Well, these you really are the are. kind of guys, they're big playmakers. How many times do you hear people yeah. say, come up with a big play at the crucial time? And this is what these kind of guys deliver. Conley in the secondary, I mean, you know, they, you may beat them a few times, yeah. but you're not going to beat them consistently all day long. And when it matters the most, they have been used to stepping up and making the big plays that count. The guy that operates in the slot for Penn State is Deshaun Hamilton. He's impressed with the defensive backfield. Very athletic. They're very physical as well. Um, you know, they really rely on their instincts and their, and their technique, basically, and that's what's won them games so far, especially at the back end. Uh, they got one of the best uh, defensive back units in the nation, and you can see that it, it stands out on film. They're very good, very fast. So, you know, it's going to be a great matchup for us, and, and really we're just looking forward to it because almost all the DBs in the Big Ten are probably some of the top DBs in the nation. I was on that jet. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Conley has two picks. Really good corner, one of the top five in the conference without question. Webb has moved from corner to safety. Hooker has four interceptions at safety. Latimer has three. Three. I mean, they're just a really, really good secondary. And Steve, real quick, well, an interesting recruiting standpoint. There's only two players on the roster from Pennsylvania. Hooker is one of them. Right. But, look, this is like a true big 33 game, isn't it? Pennsylvania yeah. versus Ohio. Mandy Nyad comes back, and we'll talk with Joey Galloway as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. Well, he has Ohio State roots and now has an ESPN job. Mandy Nyad is now joined by Joey Galloway. Thanks so much, Steve. I'm joined now by 16-year NFL vet, Ohio State wide receiver, and current college football analyst for ESPN, Joey Galloway. How are you? 
I'm good. How you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll dive right into it. Obviously, JT Barrett is an impressive and veteran quarterback. What differences have you seen from him this season versus his first two years? Well, it's his team. And last season, we all know about the uh, rotation of, of quarterbacks uh, that Ohio State was, was going through at the time. And, you know, and this coming into this season, uh, it is his football team. He's the leader. He's the captain. Uh, he's the guy that everybody, not just the offense, but the defense, the special teams, everybody on the team, he's the guy they look to for leadership. It also helps that the Buckeyes' offensive line is really good. How much of an advantage is it for Ohio State up front? Uh, these guys have done a really nice job of, of building an offensive line uh, that when guys graduate, when guys go to the NFL, uh, they've been able to reload and continue a long line of uh, talented guys up front. And, you know, the reason they've been able to run the ball this season, whether it's been Mike Weber or JT Barrett or Curtis Samuel, has been because the offensive line has done such a nice job of uh, opening holes and protecting JT when he's in the pocket. Now, you're an Ohio State guy. You've seen it all, the highs and lows of this program. What do you have to say about the Urban Meyer era? Uh, it has been fun to watch. It has been fun to be around. Um, I live in Columbus, so I've had um, a lot of opportunities to sit in with you know Coach Meyer and just sort of listen to him as he coaches and, and just sort of learn football from him. So it's been a lot of fun. If you're a Buckeye fan, it couldn't get any better. And if you're just a football fan in general, which I am, um, it's been fun to watch a program uh, go out and play the way they have. Is Coach Urban Meyer as impressive as his 56-4 and four record makes it seem? You know what, and it is, it is the, it's the attention to detail that, uh, that gets you with him. You, you know when you're around a coach like him, um, and I've been around um, a lot of coaches, Coach Belichick, uh, Coach Parcells, Coach Gruden, uh, and, and the thing that separates uh, these coaches is the attention to detail that they, that they come to work with every single day, and Coach Meyer is one of those guys. Switching gears now to Penn State, how do you assess this football team in its rebuilding process? Well, I think that in just like uh, the fan base at Penn State, um, everyone's sort of waiting to take that next step uh, out of the rebuilding phase. And when you're dealing with a situation where you are limited in scholarships, um, that hurts a program and it takes time for a program to build. As now you get back all your scholarships, you still have to build that depth and you still have to be within the boundaries of how many scholarships you can hand out in a season. And, and, and Penn State is just now coming out of that. And so it may take a, another year or so uh, to allow for that depth. And, and that depth, uh, people think about, you know, on Saturdays when you're playing games, um, how many guys you come into a game with. But truly the depth uh, speaks to what you can do in practice and, and what kind of reps you can have um, with, you know, good on good, uh, that's where your depth really comes into play because, you know, you, you have to go to practice every single day. And as you start to build your program and as you continue to build, the amount of guys that you can use in practice that are talented will matter as you go into your season and play games. And you mentioned the fan base. Ohio State is a 19-and-a-half-point favorite. How long do you see this fan base tolerating being the underdog against these top 10 teams? I hope that the, the fans are patient. I really hate the, uh, the, the direction that college football is headed now where these coaches have, you know, a couple years, a few years to turn a program around. I, I think, you know, and every year we start to talk about uh, coaches on the hot seat. And you'll look down and they'll have been at the school for like two or three years. And that is just not enough time for any coach to come into a rebuilding situation. And you look at Coach Meyer and the success he's had, mm -hmm. uh, he was coming to a program that was already talented. Um, and when you look at what Coach Franklin stepped into, it's a situation where, you know, they're rebuilding – uh, they're still dealing with uh, not having a full uh, complement of scholarships. So it's a different situation. And hopefully uh, the fan base and, and, and the school itself, the administrators, uh, have some patience. And, you know, because it's just a building process and it takes time. Joey, what can Penn State do to spring the upset here? Hmm. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't see it happening. Um, you know, it, at Penn State is a tough place to play. 
Um, you know, the, the crowd is, is nuts there. Uh, they're loud, uh, difficult. But Ohio State is a more talented team than Penn State right now. Um, I would say Barkley would have to have a really big game for Penn State to have a chance to stay in it because not well, uh, not just does that mean that Penn State is having success, but it's also keeping uh, J.T. Barrett and the Ohio State offense on the sideline. So uh, I, I would say Barkley is, is the best option for Penn State to pull it off, but he has to have a really big game. Joey, thank you so much for joining us. We'll catch you from the studio in Bristol. Back to you guys. Great job as always, Mandy. Our thanks to Joey Galloway. All right, coming up, we'll take a look at the good, the bad, the ugly. Our picks are keys to the game. Trey said something about turnovers earlier, so Todd and I scratched that <laughs> off the list as we continue with Blue White Tailgate after this. We get to the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, we've gone through fan mail, and on fan mail, it's been determined that Todd is the good. I think I'll take the good here, but not good. Great. The 1986 National Championship team coming yeah. back for a 30-year reunion, 12-0, culminating in the win over number one Miami, and someone we know had a few tackles yeah. in that game. I'd also like to add Joey Julius, his appearance on Good Morning yeah. America can never get too much exposure for Joey and his fight with the binge eating disorder and getting the word out there that he's out there to help anyone who is also battling that. Fan mail says you're the bad boy. Yeah, I guess I am the bad boy, and I'll take that. That's fine. I guess I have two bads for this week. One is Purdue firing Daryl Hazel, like with, what, six games left to go in the season. I mean, I don't understand why the colleges are doing that. They're pulling the plug on these coaches. You know, it's not the right thing to do, in my opinion. They shouldn't do it. The other thing is people in East Lansing, they're worrying about Michigan State. They've lost the last four. I mean, Mark D'Antonio has run one of the best programs in the country over the last 10, 12 years. It's like, just calm down. You know, it's going to be a tough year for them, but they're going to be fine. Uh, and by fan mail, I get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and on that... Uh, to me, the call, the 15-yard penalty on Urban Meyer was ridiculous. It is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Urban Meyer was exactly right. All right please. <laughs> I, I could, I could. All right, let's get to the picks. All right, Todd, you got an interesting one. You got West Virginia TCU. How about West Virginia moving up in the rankings? They're unbeaten, and uh, Morgantown's not an easy place to play. The Big 12, they said, we're not expanding, so we're going to keep the conference the same, and we'll see how the Mountaineers do. But I think the Horned Frogs leave Morgantown with a loss. I've got Wisconsin, Iowa. This is a tough game. Uh, it's in at car. It's going to be taking place, obviously, Kinnick. Uh, I was coming off a win where they feel better about themselves, but it was Purdue. Wisconsin, tough game with Ohio State. But I think Wisconsin's the better team. I'm going to go with them. Now, Trey, <laughs> okay, you, you don't like either team. No, you like Navy. I like Navy. Okay, Come on. Okay, okay, we have to pick a game where you like teams. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, I don't like Memphis because they cheat in <laughs> basketball, but that's a whole other story. I think that, I think that Navy is just, you know, running that triple option, it's very difficult to defend. I don't think Memphis has the guys. I think Navy beats them. Well, every week Al Alabama's picked by Jay. So, Jay, what do you have, Alabama, Texas A&M? Thanks, Steve. Once again this week, as you said, I got Alabama. If I keep picking them, I might have to move down there and run for governor. I still like the Tide this week. I think it's going to be closer than people think because I'm not sold on their big wins. Well, so we'll see what happens, but I still like Alabama. And back to you, Steve, for some keys to the game with Penn State and Ohio State. Keys to the game. Look, you were so anxious early. You go first. I was saying just about the turnovers, but it's always important. I think it's going to be containing JT Barrett, less than 50 yards rushing, keep him under 200 yards passing. Penn State has a legitimate shot to win this game. That, uh, Key to the game, I'm looking right at the defense. You've got to get some early stops. They were overwhelmed at Michigan in the big house, and that game was pretty much over after a few drives. They've got to get them off the field and keep the crowd in the game. Explosive plays, A, containing them, to your point, B, getting a few of your own, which gets the crowd electrified, give away, take away, electrified, get this game to the last five minutes, and the crowd's electrified. All right, there we go. Yep. You notice none of us wore anything white. We didn't want to peak too soon. <laughs> we'll talk to you next week.